right, you may be seated. It's good to see everyone here this morning. Uh, we're continuing a sermon series on starting over again. And as I was thinking about what that meant for me, uh, I thought about a desk. And after the first of the year, one of the things that we did at our household is we went through every bookshelf, every desk that just had papers and books on it, and we started straightening up. Now, some of you have already seen this, and you've seen how the shade is a little bit cattywampus here, and there's mess up here because you love order. Well, part of starting over again is putting things in proper order, right? So I'm going to get my, my pamphlets and my bills and my books, and I'm going to put them all in the right spot. Now, some of you are so chaotic that you know where all of your stuff is in the midst of the mess. Amen? Yeah, so some of you are like, challenge accepted, the messier the better. However, when we're starting over again, we've got to put first things first and make sure that nothing slips through the cracks because if something slips through the cracks, then everything is thrown out of order. That's what it means to start over again. Now, I want you to think about that for your life of faith. Maybe this desk and straightening that up is, is a perfect example of what that means for you. Starting over again as we move forward. Now, I want you to think about some of the goals that you might have for this year. Some people call those resolutions. I'm, I'm not talking about those. I'm actually talking about getting beneath the surface or the veneer of things that we just want to do differently. I'm talking about getting to the heart of the matter of what we call in the Christian world, we call them spiritual disciplines. That when we start over again, it's not just a matter of kind of polishing up the veneer. It's a matter of actually going in a little bit deeper and getting to the heart of of the matter. And so when we start over again, this, this passage of scripture should be central to everything that we're going to focus on over these next few weeks. It's from the gospel of Matthew chapter 6, and it's our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ talking about how to start over again or to put things in proper order. And he says this, but seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all of these things will be given to you as well. Can we all say that together? But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all of these things will be given to you as well. So we're not talking about house. We're not talking about health necessarily. We're not talking about family necessarily. Those actually are not the primary things. The primary things is who is it that we're seeking. And over the next several weeks, we're going to start over again by making sure we have our focus where it needs to be. And so today we're starting off with a question, the central question. It's a question of submission. Who owns what? So let me pray for you as we dig in, okay? Let me pray for you, and during this time, maybe you can pray for me as well. Lord Jesus, we thank you, and we come before you with humble hearts. We come before you needing a touch of your grace. We come before you in need of that which only you can provide. And so, Lord, I pray that you will break through the veneer that you won't just give us what we want, Lord, but that you will reveal what it is that we need. Lord, we are your people, and, and God, we have prayed that there would be an awakening that kicks off today in every pew. Make it so, Lord. We are your people, and this is your place. Inhabit us right now. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So as we kick off, starting on the question of, of who owns what, as we start over again. I want us to go to the very first verse in the very first book of the Bible. It comes from Genesis chapter 1. And it's so short and so powerful. I'd love us all to say it all at the same time. That way you can say that you spoke scripture to someone today by repeating what it is that God had shared with you. So let's all share together Genesis chapter 1, verse 1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Man, that sounds pretty awesome, right? In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And so here's, here's the first thing I want you to, to keep in mind as we focus on going deeper, starting over again, and understanding who owns what. The, the first thing I want you to, to understand, and maybe you need to write this down just to put it in proper perspective, is that the creator made it all. Now you're like, yeah, okay, I get it. But do you? That the creator, the God who, who fashioned you and I in, in Psalm 39, it says that, that the Lord formed us together in our mother's womb. That creator, that before it, 
one breath of life took place, he already knew our days out in front of us. This creator who put the stars in the sky, who out of the void created the earth, who out of nothing in his great expanse of time decided to form the planets. This God who created both, both animal and man and woman, the creator created it all. There's nothing on this planet or anything that we can imagine that is good that God did not have his hand on. That there's no expanse of discovery that we might find in the universe at one day that God did not have his hand on. And there's nothing at the depths of the ocean that we have not yet explored that God did not have his hand on. There's nothing in this world that God did not create. So the question of who's the owner, the question is not you, or the answer is not you, and it's not me. It's actually the Lord of the universe who created everything at a particular time and a particular place. And this is huge. I didn't always get this. Even though I grew up in a Methodist church, and I love the grace of the Methodist church. But I, I will say this about the Methodist church. The Methodist church has not always been fantastic of pointing, putting A and B together. And I kind of had the understanding that, uh, yeah, God created it, but I was the master of my own domain. That if something was going to be, it was up to me. That if I worked hard, I would get a good job. If I worked hard, I would get the grades. If I worked hard, I would earn it and it would be mine. So when I grew up, I didn't have an understanding of God owns it and I just get to be a part of it and be a steward of it. What I understood growing up, and, I, and guys, I went to church probably more often than you did. And I grew up, that was part of my culture growing up. That was part of who I am. I heard every sermon. I sung every song. I was there to put up tables and chairs. I was there all the time because that's part of what my family dynamic was. But I still, even though I sat there and experienced it, I still didn't understand that God was the owner. So when I got my first job, I kept all the money for myself because I thought it was mine. Whenever I wanted something, I didn't think about giving honor and glory to God. I gave honor and glory to myself because I wanted it. And when we fail to understand that God owns everything, then it really creates a stumbling block for us to submit to the Lord, to put first things first, to, to start over again. You know that passage of scripture that I mentioned at the very beginning that Jesus said, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and everything else will fall into place. That's my paraphrase of it. I couldn't even do that even though I grew up in a church because I didn't understand who owned what. And, and I'm not the only one. Let's go back to the story of Adam and Eve in Genesis chapter 2. We're, we're spending some time on the Old Testament, but we are going to end up in the New Testament, I promise. The story of Adam and Eve, it, part of the story is this. God, the Lord, God, took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden. Eden, Eden is utopia. Eden is everything. Eden is where you're walking naked and unashamed, not just figuratively, but literally with God. Everything God had created was in the Garden of Eden, and he created Adam, and he put Adam there to work it and take care of it. Did, did Adam create it? All right, Methodist, let me, let me, come on now. The Lord created, this is kind of basic stuff, the Lord created the Garden of Eden. Did Adam create it? Okay, very good. Y'all stick with me. And the Lord God commanded the man, you are free to eat from any tree in the garden, but you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, for when you eat from it, you will certainly die. Now, I want you to think about this. He created all of the Garden of Eden. He created Adam. He said, everything that I have created, Adam, my creation the one whom I knit together, everything I have is yours. I made it. I am giving it over to you. The only thing I require to you is that this, this portion right over here, don't even mess with it. You've got run of the place for 90% of it. And it's all yours. I made it for you to inhabit and to be, be in my grace and in my presence. But this part over here, don't even go over there. And the story continues, the Lord God said, it is not good for man to be alone, and I will make a helper suitable for him. So that's when Eve came on the scene. Now, as Christians, we understand that part of the fall, that we are all sinful by nature. You, you may be a fantastic person, and you may be super nice. You may pick up every stray animal, 
No one can say anything bad about you. But at the root of everything right underneath the surface is that we are still sinners in need of grace. Every single one of us. And some of you bristle at that, but you are not the Savior. I am not the Savior. I think I'm a pretty good guy. Not, not one amen. Okay, so I think I'm a pretty, good, a pretty good guy. Yeah, that's cool. I feel okay with myself. But, but I did not make myself. And no matter how good I think I am, look, there's still, there's still a pretty strong streak of sinfulness and rebellion in me. <laughs> the timing is off just a little bit, y'all. <laughs> but thank you, Bob. I appreciate that right over here. But look, I know that about myself. And I know that about you. That we are all sinners in need of grace. Every single one of us. And that's why it's so important that God must be first. The act of submission is understanding that God must be first. Now, now I say submission, and some of us are like, oh, that's, that phrase has been used to weird extremes, and it has. You know, y'all heard before that wives should submit to your husbands, but that's only taking a proof text of that whole scripture. It actually says before that, that husbands ought to submit their lives to Christ. And part of that is that as wives and husbands mutually submit to one another, God is glorified. It's not lording over anybody. So that's been kind of taken in weird spots. But when we're talking about who we are as disciples, it's understanding of God is first. And when God is not first, everything gets messed up. So some of you may be familiar with the story of the Garden of Eden of what happens. Adam and Eve are there. They, they are naked. They're unashamed. They're living in total relationship with God who walks with them in the garden. And they were tempted because the snake came up and said, you know what God said? You don't really have to take it seriously. Forget who made this place. Forget it. If you want the apple, take the apple. Forget what he said. He's trying to restrict you. You've got, yeah, he told you you've got 90% of this place, but you have to have the other part, the other 10. So take of it because that's what you want. And what happened? They took of it, both Adam and Eve took of it. And their relationship was broken because no longer were they living a blessed life. Now they were living a life of scarcity. They weren't living a life of abundance. They were living a life of scarcity. Because instead of focusing on the 90% of what they did have, they tried to start spending the 10% that they didn't have. And they didn't give credit where credit was due. They forgot who owned it all. So the next thing I want you to remember is this, is that Adam and Eve fell when they forgot who owned it. I remember going through a, a financial, uh, Michelle and I, when we were, we, once again, I, I, I did not grow up really understanding who owned the whole thing. And the whole idea of stewardship was, was not part of my understanding. It was God placed me here. I knew that Jesus loved me. This was before I was a pastor. Jesus loved me. I had a good relationship with Jesus. Jesus knew my quirks. I knew he was gracious. I was just going to keep on doing what I was going to do. Even regarding how to build a family. And how to understand finances. And how to understand what ownership is. And I remember when Michelle and I were first married, we got married and we had one car. We lived on the corner of 4th and Indiana in Lubbock, Texas. In, a, in a, an apartment complex that used to be a hotel. There were mice that ran in and through the apartment complex because there was a big hill. I'm sorry, a big field next to us. And so when it got cold, the mice would run across the street and come to our house. So we had pets without having to make a pet deposit. So that was pretty cool. And, and so I had a bicycle that I rode everywhere as I was working and going to school. And Michelle had a little Ford Ranger pickup truck, which was about this big, and that I tried to squeeze into when I needed to. And, man, we couldn't rub two nickels together. It, it, and mainly because I didn't plan for it. We just loved each other. Love. And, and I remember many times I'd have to call my dad and say, and this was after I was married, Dad, man, I, I don't know if I'm going to, can, can I borrow, can, can, I, can I borrow $200? I was married, going to my daddy, 
and saying, Daddy, can I borrow $200? He go, yeah, that's fine. I go, I'll, I'll pay you back. And many times I did pay him back, eventually. And then, uh, you know, that kind of began, I, have, I was really trying, but because I didn't put first things first and I didn't really understand what that meant, I was always playing catch up. I, I started our life together with Michelle under a cloud of scarcity instead of abundance. And my dad had to pay for it. And actually, it started, it continued actually when we became pastors back in 98. Uh, I became pastor, look, she's a pastor spout. She's very much a part of it just as much as I am, okay? So we're all in this, and, and we still couldn't scrape two nickels to rub together. And we had Hannah, and Jacob was on his way. And I remember calling dad after I was a pastor. I was 24, 25 years old. I go, dad, man, I, I don't know if I can make it. And he asked this question. He said, wait, are you tithing? And I go, whoa, 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 whoa. I didn't call for a sermon. I called for a handout. <laughs> and he didn't say it in a negative way. But he asked us such a question that I was like, uh, no. Man, we're just trying to survive. And he goes, well, you've got to put first things first. And when you do that, everything else will begin to fall into place. And I was a pastor. I'd heard the scripture before. But then actually put it in real life was the hardest thing to do. See, I was focused on the whole 100% instead of just the 90. And my whole life was a life of scarcity up to that moment. Because I forgot who owned it or I was trying to take ownership of it. And so I wasn't really found faithful in the little things. Just being honest with you. I wasn't being found faithful in the little things. I was the pastor of the church. I'd grown up in the church. I was married, had two beautiful children. My wife loved me, but I wasn't being faithful in the little things. And so I really wasn't being found faithful in the big things. And one of the things I understand, if you go to the New Testament, Jesus talks about this and the tension that's there within when we forget who the ownership is. When, 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 we, when we talk the talk, when we have a form of godliness, but we lack any power, because we haven't submitted. And the outflow of it is this. In Luke 16, whoever can be trusted with very little can't be trusted with much. And whoever is dishonest with very little will also be dishonest with much. God must be first, and not just in our heart, but in our actions. God must be first, not only in our heart, but in our actions. It's not just enough to you to say that God loves you in your heart, but you, there's no evidence in your life whatsoever that you're actually putting God first. And I heard this example this week that really resonated with me because I'm a dad, and maybe it'll resonate with you as well. I'm going to change it up a little bit because I'm going to use my family as a reference. So Hannah and Rebecca, they're my two, my two girls, my, my daughters, and I, I want the very best for them. I, I, I had a part in creating them. I mean, I, I was part of that. And I experienced childbirth the exact same way that Michelle did when those babies were born. <laughs> so, probably even more so, so. But don't ask her. She understands that I felt the same way that we did. So anyway, with Hannah and, and, and Rebecca, and really with all the kids, but I'm just going to use Hannah and Rebecca right now. Whenever they bring a boy home for the first time, Here's one of my concerns, that this is someone that they're taking seriously, that, that this person might have serious intentions with one of my daughters. And my understanding is that if, if you're going to be serious with my daughters, you're going to come to me and let's talk. Let's, let's be a man about it. If you're man enough to want to play house, then come to the dad. That's my take on it. And one thing I'm going to ask you, and I can tell you because there's no one in this room that will be dating my daughters, okay? So <laughs> if, you, if you come to me, I'm going to ask you about your faith. And if you tell me you go to church, I'm going to give you a high five. Boop. If you say that you, you love all people, I'm going to give you a high five. Boop. If you say that, that, that you believe in helping people, I'm going to give you a high five. Boop. And that you have a great job, I'm going to give you a high five. Boop. But then I'm going to ask you, 
how are you keeping the main thing the main thing? How, how, are you, how are you actually living this out in your faith? Like, how are you giving? And if a man who has serious intentions with my daughter whom I created or helped create comes in and says, well, you know what? I, 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 don't, really, I don't really give. I don't really have a budget. I, I, I give every once in a while when I've got like 10 or 20 bucks, uh, but I really love your daughter. And, and I really, really, I, I, I want to see if this is serious. You know what my response is going to be? You haven't been found faithful in the little things, so why should I trust you with the big things? And there's no treasure on this earth more valuable to me than my daughter's. So why would I want her to be hitched up with someone who hasn't put first things first? You following me? It's kind of like the church, y'all. Did you know that the church is the bride of Christ? The church is called the bride of Christ. That, that the church, in my understanding, the church is God's idea, Christ is the head, and we play follow the leader. And I saw somebody out there, a couple of people, kind of roll your head back and go, oh man, this is a tithing sermon. Hey, you know what? I'm not pulling any punches with you. It is. You know why? Because God has more in store for you and this church than what we have settled for. We've been acting like the guy who comes to date the daughter thinking that if we just kind of show a little bit of effort, everything's going to be okay. We've forgotten who the owner is. We wouldn't satis be satisfied with that for our daughter or our sons. But God comes and says, look, everything that is created is mine. And the church is mine. The church is God's idea. Christ is the head and we play follow the leader. And so Christians, this is the next thing I want you to remember, that the Christians should give their best first out of gratitude. Christians should give their first best out of, or their best first out of gratitude. Let me tell you the continuation of my story. It wasn't probably until five years into being a pastor that because of decisions and, and starting over again time and time again and, and trying to put first things first, that Michelle and I finally began to get on the same page because we had to, to say no to a lot of things so we could say yes to the main thing. About putting our, our financial house in order, but also our worldview in order, that yes, we were a pastor's family, but who did we really put our faith in? You following me? And so we really had to take some serious steps to put everything in order. And yes, we were not making much money. And yes, we had two kids that wanted to be fed and they wanted to be clothed and they need to go to school. But yet we had to make some tough decisions to do that. And so we began by, be, by giving our first, giving our best first out of gratitude. And you know what happened with that? We began to understand life a little bit differently. We began to live with a sense of generosity instead of scarcity. Instead of people coming around and saying, hey, this is a great opportunity. Will you give or will you help? And us going, man, we can't even, we can't do that. But yet we would find money to go to Taco Bell. That stopped. Because we kept the main thing, the main thing. God has given us everything and he just asked for our best first. And so we changed how we budgeted or we actually began to budget. And we changed how we did things. And I can, I can tell you now that your pastor, and I, and I have to pay, I just want to, some of you are like, well, you, you know, you're a pastor. I have to pay self-employment taxes. Did y'all know that? Yeah, pastors, we're weird. But according to the IRS, we're really weird, okay? So we, we have to pay self-employment taxes. So if you've ever paid self-employment taxes, those are pretty high, right? I, I pay that. But you know what I pay first? The tithe. I give back to the church because the church is God's idea. Christ is the head. We play follow the leader. Not because I have to. It's because if I don't, then I'm just like a clinging gone, expecting y'all to be faithful, but I'm not. Why would I do that? I've got to follow up my faith with actions. And then I pay my taxes. And then I put money aside for savings. It's because God deserves the best first. And it took me a while but hopefully you're a little bit quicker than I am on that. I, I want, and the reason I, I share this with you is, be, is because 
I think we, we are living underneath the veneer of what life will really be until we put God first. Think about what would happen in your life if you, re- if you began to live into the blessing of knowing that God had given you 100% of what you have, but out of gratitude you gave the best first and you learned to live in gratitude and generosity on the 90. I mean, some of you are like, there's no way I'm not going to do that. Then you're missing out. Because I speak from experience, I know that. I know that. And I missed out. But also I want you to think about the church. Man, uh, it was a huge accomplishment. I mean, praise God from whom all blessings flow. A, A big, hairy, audacious goal was met in December when you all sacrificially gave. Man, that is phenomenal. In over 10 years, the church had not done that. But I want you to think about that the church, you should not be having to get a letter or multiple letters at the end of the year begging you to give to the body of Christ. Because we as disciples, look, we are called to live into the blessings that God has given us. I want you to imagine something. Imagine instead of us having Lord's Acre every fall where we had to fund a project like the sound system or lighting or buying a van, instead of us having to find extra money to do something that benefits us, what if we did Lord's Acre because we were all giving God our best first throughout the year to our general fund because the church is God's idea, Christ is the head, we play follow the lead. What if at Lord's Acre there was a different type of energy where we got together and said, look, we're going to raise funds this year, not for lighting, not for parking lot, not for sound system, but because we want to start a new faith community in another area. Or we came to Lord Jacob and we said, look, there is, there is a certain group of teachers at Acton Elementary School or Acton Middle School that how about we raise funds for a scholarship since they have to spend so much money out of pocket for school supplies as a teacher, as an educator, how about for Lord Jacob, we raised money instead that all the money that was raised would go towards these teachers that had to spend money out of their own pocket. That's a different type of energy. That's out of the overflow, not scarcity. Imagine that Lord Jacob at the end of the year, or on Christmas Eve, we had a Christmas Eve offering. And instead of going, man, I hope they give enough money so we can be $1 over on income than expenses, what if on the Christmas Eve offering, because we're talking about the incarnation of Christ, what if we as a church body, we all spent the whole year giving our best first? And at Christmas Eve, we were able to stand up among all the people who never come to church except that one time. And we were able to say that because of the generosity of the people of this church, every dollar that's raised tonight over the Christmas Eve services, because our Christian people, our church body, put their best first. Every dollar that's raised tonight for the Christmas Eve service, we're going to send it to start a church in Mexico. Or we're going we're to do something with it where maybe we're going to pay off medical bills for people who are underwater that it would not stay here, but it would go into the world. As the light pierces the darkness, that happens. When we submit and we put God first, and we give our best first, not the leftovers. So here's some things that, that the Lord might, might lead you to do. These are some action steps. That might, as, you, as you remember, think about it. You're trying to put first things first. You're trying to start over again. And you're trying to seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and put everything into place. One is commit to God that you will give God the first and best of your labor. The first and best, not the last. Some of you are looking at me with really sour expressions right now because that's not what you signed up for. You don't want to hear that. Why? Because it might mean that we have to reorder things. Yes, that's the life of faith. We don't just want God to bless us. We want to do what God is blessing. So commit to God that you will give God the first and best of your labor. And can I just, uh, just as a perspective, as your senior pastor, I'm, I'm someone that everyone at least is aware of. Do you want to get my leftovers or do you want to get my best on Sundays? What about during the week when you come up to the church? Do you want my, you want my best do you want me to fully engage with you when you were in the office and you're having a conversation with me? Or do you want to get my leftovers? What do you want? So you have that desire from me. 
And I'm just human. But God created you to bask in his glory. And you're curling your nose up about giving God your best first. Also, commit to the changes that need to make it happen. Look, for Michelle and I, I told you, it took us a long time. We had to start over again many times, but we were committed to it. What are the changes that you need to make? And then also share your struggle with one other person. There, there's someone around here who thinks that everyone else in the church gives more than they do. No one understands the situation that you're in. Why not tell somebody? I found that when I shared my struggle with actually people that I was in a small group with, even as a pastor, you know what burden that lifted off my shoulders? Because up to that point, I was living in shame. But when I mentioned it to one other person, then we, yeah, we're the same way. And I'm like, for real? They go, oh, yeah. And I go, praise the Lord, there's strength in numbers. And God began to work through that. So over these next several weeks, we're going to keep on starting over again. We're going to talk about prayer, and we're going to talk about fasting. We're going to talk about worship. We're going to talk about celebration. We're going to talk about service. What are the things that we need to put first so we can have everything in proper order? The last prayer I want to share with you is this, and we'll throw it up here on the screen. Maybe you want to pray it with, you, with us. Let me share it with you. Jesus, I am yours, and you are mine. Awaken me when I doze off to that promise. That's in your GPS. You can also have that as well when you leave today. But can we all share that out loud? Jesus, I am yours and you are mine. Awaken me when I doze off from that promise. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit and all of God's people said...